Hello, everybody. This is Blaine DeSantis, and I welcome you to America's Game. That's right. This is the beginning of my semi-regular snapshot podcast on baseball. And what do I have to say about that? Well, let's sing it together, folks. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out to the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. I don't care if I ever get back, so let's root, root, root for the home team. If they don't win, it's a shame. Because it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Oh, baseball, folks. I love baseball. Uh, I don't care if it's the beginning or middle of February when spring training starts, the beginning of the season in April or whenever. I just love baseball baseball. But if you're like me, you're saying to yourself, you know, what they call baseball is a little bit different than I remembered. And I'm not so sure like things like the designated hitter rule. Um, All these teams from expansion, which diluted the talent pool terribly, this stuff about analytics and launch angles and starting runners at second base in the 10th inning. Are you kidding me? What is this all about? It doesn't look like the game we grew up loving. And I have always been a nut about history and a nut about the old timers. And that's what America's game is. We're going back. None going back. We're going way back, folks. We're going back and we're going to sit down and semi-regularly, as I said, have a little chat about baseball. And it's going to be a little bit more leisurely because I'm going to sit here. I'm going to, I'm having a cup of coffee as I do this. That's right. And I hope you do too. Sit back, relax, and think about and join me for a little discussion on baseball. And for our first episode, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the game and the Hall of Fame, because that's where so much about baseball is stored. It is the repository. That's correct. It's the repository for baseball memories, memorabilia, items, you name it. They got it there. It is out of this world. You know, where did it start? Where did this game we call baseball, America's game, our national pastime, where did it begin? Whole books have been written about this. You wouldn't believe the amount of scholarly work that's been going on about this. It's out of this world. Some people, yes, there are some people who believe that Jane Austen invented the game of baseball. Now, how could Jane Austen do this? Well, back in 1796, in her book, Northanger Abbey, she wrote that Catherine was not noble. Instead of reading books, she was out playing baseball. Well, where did that come from? How did she pull baseball out of a hat? I don't have any earthly idea. That's unbelievable. But that wasn't the first. No, 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 no. That wasn't the first. We can go back to 1791. In Pittsfield, Massachusetts. That's right. Pittsfield, of all places. And that's where the rules for the preservation of the windows of the new meeting house were promulgated. A new meeting house? Oh, yeah. Apparently, windows were being broken. And so they set out a rule that there will be no ball playing. That's right. Specifically, they say baseball. No baseball may be played within 80 yards of the new meeting house. we got to protect the windows. Wow. So there it was. Was that the beginning of it? Where did it come from? We don't know. We know that the Egyptians played games with balls and sticks. There's hieroglyphics with regard to that. My wife, yes, my wife, she of Romania, proudly points out the game of Oina. O-I-N-A is the national game of Romania. And what is it? It's sort of like baseball. Not completely like baseball, but sort of like baseball. It's got a field, rectangular, albeit. It's got nine players, and somebody throws a ball up in the air, and somebody hits the ball and runs the bases. Okay, that sounds a lot like it, but not completely. No, not completely. Well, how about stool ball? You ever hear of stool ball? No, there's another one. How did stool ball come into existence? Apparently, this is a good one. Milkmaids would sit milking their cows on on the milk stool and would then toss a ball back and forth to each other trying to hit the ball. I kid you not, folks. There are many, many, many places where, where people want to take credit for 
beginning the game of baseball. One thing it's not is cricket. Now, cricket didn't do it. Rounders, maybe. Town ball was very close to this, but you know what? Let's try to figure out some of the things where the actual game developed, not where it was invented, but how did it develop? You know, the Mills Commission, way back in 1888, it was created by Henry Spaulding. We heard of Spaulding as the uh, sporting goods thing. Well, he was a pitcher, as a matter of fact, before he got into sporting goods, a very good pitcher who, by the way, is in the Hall of Fame. And Henry Chadwick, who is now another member of the Hall of Fame, who was an Englishman and was a sports writer and statistician. He fell in love with baseball. And because of that, he kept saying it was an English game. It reminded him of an English game. Well, they ended up having a bet, and they created this thing called the Mills Commission to determine where did the game start. And it all came down to a letter they got from a guy by the name of Abner Graves, who said, I was there. I was there when Abner Doubleday came and took all us rowdy kids in, in Cooperstown, New York, and drew out a field and taught us how to play the game of baseball. It was great. Now, this he said at the time, according to this, he would have been around four years old. It's amazing how he could remember some of the details. I mean, he even in a letter said that he had names of people who were in this game, okay? And that it was definitely Abner Doubleday. At the time, however, that Mr. Graves wrote this letter, he happened to be in what is commonly referred to as an insane asylum. So we're not quite sure of the veracity of what Mr. Graves had to say. Nonetheless, let's go take a look, and we find that yes, yes, at that time, uh, a young Abner Doubleday was in New York, but he wasn't in Cooperstown. No, he was at West Point. That's right. He was in West Point, and he was not out on leave at the time that Mr. Graves said that he was there teaching the game of baseball. You know, whether Abner Doubleday had anything to do with the game of baseball, which we doubt or not, the game has grown up and considers Cooperstown its birthplace. Even if it's only a birthplace in terms of novelty, it's still our birthplace of baseball. But many people, Many people want to claim that they invented baseball. As a matter of fact, you know, Abner Doubleday is not in the Hall of Fame. No, no. They have Doubleday Field, which is where they play some uh, exhibition games. But Doubleday himself, other than a portrait, is not in the game and not in the Hall of Fame. Nope, not there. Who is there? Ah, well, that is Alexander Joy Cartwright. That's correct. Alexander Joy Cartwright even says he is the founder of the game of baseball. This is on his plaque, folks, in the Hall of Fame. It says that he sat there and that he uh, set the base paths, the like, amount of feet between the base players. He uh, was a member of the Knickerbockers. He wrote the rules of the game. And he then spread it to the West Coast, teaching to the Indians, to the pioneers, and went over to Hawaii with it also. There it is. There it is. Where did baseball come from? It came from <laughs> Alexander Joy Cartwright, who, according to the Hall of Fame plaque, yep, was the guy who's invented the game. <clears throat> wrong. This is so wrong in so many ways. I, I, it's, it's, oh. They have found out that Mr. Cartwright's son and grandson were forging entries of diaries. That's right. They wanted him to be recognized, and they forged things so that he would be recognized as the man who invented the game. He didn't do this. No, he didn't set the base paths. He didn't write the rules. And there's no evidence at all that he did anything with the game of baseball in Hawaii. I don't know if he did it with the Indians. I don't know. They didn't, they didn't talk about it too much. So I don't know. I don't have any idea, but it's certainly not him. Okay, and I'm going to go out right there. It was not Alexander Joy Cartwright. <sighs> well, where did it start? Who did it? Well, here's a name I want you to remember. Doc Adams. Now, Doc Adams is a guy who should be in the Hall of Fame. You see, Doc Adams did, did write down and create most all the rules of the game for the Knickerbockers. That's right. And Doc Adams even created a position because the original game of baseball had only seven or eight players. He put in a shortstop. That's right. He invented the position of the shortstop. Yeah. 
very, very good because they had nobody between third base and second base. And so that created a problem. Got to put somebody there. Also, people couldn't throw the ball from outfield to the infield because of the uh, the fact that balls were made of pretty much fluffed back then. And so they needed somebody as a relay person. And that's what the shortstop was. Well, Alexander uh, Joy Cartwright claimed that he was there. He may have been a member of the Knickerbockers, but the real man who did it was none other than Doc Adams. And one of these days, it's my hope you're going to see Doc Adams get elected into the Hall of Fame, his rightful place. But, you know, there are all these guidelines as to who gets into the Hall of Fame. Have you ever considered that? What is the criteria? There is no criteria. It's what baseball writers do. And I, I don't have a real love of the Baseball Writers Association of America. No, I don't. Uh, they are, they're usually behind the time. They don't know what they're talking about half the time. And most of the times now they've gotten so wrapped up in these damn analytics. It's got you crazy. They're trying to put 250 players, two, they bat 250, and they're the next greatest thing since sliced bread. You know, that doesn't really cut it with me. You know, I don't believe you needed to have those hard and fast guidelines. You know, one time it was you had 3,000 hits. You had 300 or 500, I should say 500 home runs. You had 300 wins. You know, you got in the Hall of Fame. Granted, you do all of that, you deserve to be in the Hall of Fame, okay? But it's not always the case. There are a lot of players who are going to do very well who don't have those numbers. Let's be honest. How many leadoff hitters have those home run numbers? Okay. 3,000 hits, my friend, is a lot of hits. I mean, that's 15 years playing and 200 hits a year. That's a lot of hits. I got to be honest with you. You know, the legs get slower. The bat speed gets slower. I mean, it just gets hard to do. But there were criteria at one time. And if you didn't hit it, they didn't put you in. They then created a veterans committee, which has been a real issue from the name of it to what are the, again, what are the criteria? Who do we put in? A lot of people put their cronies in. A lot of people put their friends in. But a lot of people corrected the wrongs from people who should have been in and were excluded for some reason by, yes, that August body we know as the Baseball Writers Association of America. And it's only gotten worse in the, in the, in the recent years, folks only gotten worse as now they start pushing out their ballot. So I voted for this person. I voted for this person. I shouldn't do this. You know, we have silly things like Kurt Schilling. Kurt Schilling is not in the Hall of Fame. I'm not sure he should be in the Hall of Fame, but I don't really care what Kurt Schilling did after he was out of the game of baseball. Okay. Some people say he's controversial <clears throat> because he, he speaks, uh, he's, a, he's a conservative and he spouses things that that the, a lot of people don't like. Was he doing that while he played the game? No. Okay. Did it affect his, his performance? No. Then if that's the case, why is he being denied? Because you don't like his political ideas nowadays. I don't know. But that's the baseball writers. Oh, the paragons of virtue. Can't stand them, to be honest with you. And if there are any baseball writers sitting here, huh, let's talk, folks. Come down to my house. We'll have a chat about it how quality you are. But a lot of these early ball players, people didn't see because there was no video. There was no tape. All you had was, uh, all you had was, you know, uh, statistics or hand me down stories about how they, how they played the game. So the hall of fame has always been subject to problems, but we are going to be sitting here as we discuss America's game and talk about some of these guys who are in the hall that you nor I many times have ever heard of because it is filled with people. You know, it's not all Babe Ruth's. It's not all Hank Aaron's. It's not all Ken Griffey's or Mariano Rivera's friends. No, 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 not that at all. There are people in the hall of fame who no one has heard of. And so we're going to be talking about that. As a matter of fact, today in our first episode, I want to tell you about one of my favorite players in the Hall of Fame. His name is Sam Rice. Now, have you ever heard of Sam Rice? 
not Sam Rice, the guy who played for, that's Jim Rice, the guy who played for the Red Sox. Now, this is Sam Rice who played for the Washington Senators. Now, Sam Rice has got a story that is out of this world. He was playing amateur baseball, and uh, you know he was married at a young age, 17, 18 years old, had a wife, a couple of kids, and he had to go to the other uh, state to play a uh, weekend series. While he was there, his wife and family moved for a few days in with the uh, parents, his, with Sam's parents. When he got back, he went to the parents' farm. It was gone. When he got there, his wife, both his kids, his mother, his father, his sisters were all dead. A tornado had struck. A tornado had struck and killed his entire family. Oh, yeah. Not a good thing to come home to, my friends. He went into a complete depression, morose, sadness, didn't play baseball for years. As a matter of fact, he joined the Marines. That's right. He joined the Marines and was there with the Marines when they landed in Veracruz, Mexico. That's right. During World War I, he was there getting shot at. It's bad enough. <laughs> It's bad enough that this poor man had to have his entire family killed. Now he's getting shot at by the Mexicans during their landing at Veracruz. But he survived. He did survive and eventually started to play the game. Started to play the game again. And was signed by the senators to a contract. And my, did he play the game. That's right. Sam Rice played that game from 1915 until 1934. And his numbers were outstanding. He was a leadoff, number one or number two hitter. His numbers are out of this world. And yet, you know, he didn't have 500 home runs. He didn't have so many hits. He missed something. Yeah, he missed it. He missed it by 13 hits. That's right. Let's give me a few numbers, folks. For his career, he played in 2,400 games. He was at bat 9,600 times and had 2,987 hits. That's right, 2,987 hits. He was 13 hits shy of the magic 3,000. He wasn't admitted to the Hall of Fame until 1963. 1963, the Veterans Committee put him in. He had a lifetime batting average of 322. He had 498 doubles, 184 triples. He only had 34 home runs because he was not a power hitter. He knocked in over 1,000 runs, stole 351 bases, and struck out only, only 275 times in 19 seasons. He walked 708 times. He was a wonderful ball player. And yes, the Baseball Writers Association of America couldn't vote him in. Thank God there was a veterans committee, you see. And because of the Veterans Committee, Sam Rice is in the Hall of Fame. He was deserving way back when. As a matter of fact, his good friend was uh, Walter Johnson, who tried to convince him to play another year, not because he knew of the 13 hit, the 3,000 hits, I should say. No, because it, the Hall of Fame wasn't started by that time. And he still thought he could bat 300 and be of value to his new team, the Cleveland Indians, because Johnson was now the, the manager of the Indians. And Sam Rice turned him down. He said, I just don't think my play is up to the quality it would be and has been for the rest of my career. And he turned it down. You know, if he had played one more year, he would have gotten those 13 hits. He would have hit that 3,000 mark. That was the number, 3,000 hits. We would hope he would have gone in with that. We don't know. We only know that the Baseball Writers Association of America did not deem him eligible for the Hall of Fame. And it's a real shame because here is a man who has a heck of a life story, who is a great ball player, and maybe one day we'll even get into one of his uh, controversial World Series plays because that's another story in and of itself for another time. But uh, it's wonderful who's there. I, I, I encourage all of you to go look up Sam Rice. Go to his page on uh, the Baseball Hall of Fame. Go to his page. Listen to the stories. Go to his Wikipedia page if you want to. He's a great man, a great story. And, you know, he's one of those unknown heroes who played the game the way it was supposed to be played. He played America's game 
He played it our way, the game you and I knew how to play the game. Hit and run, advance the batter, steal a few bases. You know, it was a great game back then. And there are a lot of great players who most of us have not not even heard of. And I know I have not heard of a lot. So anyway, I hope that you've enjoyed our first look at America's game. I'm going to come back next time with two of my favorite old-time ball players. Oh, I think you're going to really like these guys. Again, we're back in the 1800s because there's some real stories from way back when. So anyway, for America's game and snapshots, this is Blaine DeSantis saying so long. Well, it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old.